Welcome to Round the Rotary with me, J.P. Warren. And with us today, we have one of my best friends here. Joining us today in B Cave, we have Jason Churchill, Chief Executive Officer at Petro Legacy. How are you doing today, Jason? I'm doing pretty well, man. Beautiful day out. Got uh, a nice view of the hill country here uh, from the office. So I um, feel pretty fortunate to be able to do what I do from, from where we're at. And so you've been, uh, I guess you've been self-quarantining, not quarantine, but you've been getting all the work done at the office just because there's nobody been there, correct? Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. I live three miles from the office, so um, super short commute, and it's a lot more convenient to get out of the house uh, and let Shannon and the kids do their thing, and they don't necessarily have me um, trying to shish them all day long. Um, so it's worked out pretty well, and I can go home. I have work from home. Um, quite a bit here and there, but I've been coming up to the office just about every day and see a few folks um, now and again, so it's worked out well. Before we dive into this, I kind of want you to kind of give a little background on uh, your company because we we were discussing before this even started some interesting uh, perspectives and thoughts, and for those that are listening, I kind of want to have some frame of reference on uh, who Petro Legacy is uh, before we actually begin our discussions on kind of the uh, the market outlook and the future of the uh, the oil field, so give us a little background yeah. on Petro Legacy, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely, and I think uh, get a lot of questions, um, you know, from time to time about uh, this private side of the business as well. So I think it's totally relevant to talk about it. But uh, we started about four years ago, and uh, originally we're focused in the Eagleford, but. Uh, partnered up with NCAP Investments, and they've been a great financial partner. But as a private equity portfolio company, you know, um, we went into um, an acquisition mode and really looked in a lot of different places for the opportunity to create value and find something that we could create value with. But, um, you know, real quickly found ourselves pivoting from the Eagleford to the Permian uh, for a lot of of reasons we could discuss if if you care to, but... uh, Back in 2017, uh, we bought our foothold position uh, from Pioneer and um, found ourselves located in northern Martin County. It's a great part of the basin. Um, It's still one uh, that had uh, a lot of unknowns in the productivity and the uh, potential. Uh, So it was the right place to be uh, with private equity dollars, where our job is to um, take what is an unknown uh, potential uh, test it and deliver that uh, de-risked asset to a public buyer um, eventually. At least that was the business model, and we can talk about how that's changed. But uh, Petro Legacy is now focused on um, protecting the asset that we have. Uh, it's about 25,000 acres in size today. And as our world has changed around us, uh, we've really become focused on protecting that asset so that when this all turns around, uh, we have the opportunity, hopefully, to uh, then get back to development. So that's where we stand today. I don't know if that answers what you're No, that, that does answer my question because before we start diving into some of the talking points that we were discussing earlier, I think it's important to kind of give a frame of reference on your company that is a private PE-backed company uh, versus a public company mm-hmm. and kind of where your focus is. But before we get into all that, why don't you give our, uh, our listeners a kind of a, um, an understanding on uh, your background? Sure. Yeah, so I uh, started back in uh, 2001, um, graduating from the New- University of Kansas. And a lot, some people know this, some people don't, but I was uh, a chemical engineer and uh, really got a, an awesome opportunity to pivot right at the beginning of my career from chemical engineering background, you know, refining, like taking a barrel, turning it into products like gasoline, and jet fuel, and diesel. Um, from that part of the business to the upstream part of the business. And I was really lucky because um, the recruiter at, at ExxonMobil gave me that, that opportunity and that option. And it wasn't one I was looking for initially, but um, fell in love with it um, and went into the, the drilling group at, at Exxon. Um, spent, four, spent five years there. And uh, it was a great place to start. Um, got to drill in a lot of places around the United States. But what I recognized kind of early on in my career um, was that I wasn't going to get a lot of exposure in other parts of the business, like really understand how, you know, we take uh, 
you know, the mineral opportunity and turn it into a financial opportunity, um, which is something I was curious about and wanted to learn more. So um, that's where I began looking for opportunities to get outside of that silo. And um, in 2006, um, I got the opportunity to leave and join XTO Energy and go to work in the Barnett Shale. And it was amazing. It was uh, everything that I was looking for. I mean, got to um, stay in the engineering side of the business, operational, uh, but moved into production and completion. It's where I learned how, um, you know, to manage an inventory of wells, um, be part of an asset team, um, you know, protect the cash flow from the app, build the cash flow from the asset and then protect it so that you could fund other projects within the, the company. So, um, at that point in time, uh, after about five years, um, Exxon, Exxon bought XTO and, um, you know, there I was again in a kind of a strange position where I, I, I knew what I had left before and I knew what I was looking for. So at that point in time, this is 2010, I began looking for the right opportunity and I'd heard about private equity. Um, you know, I had guys, uh, explaining, you know, to me what that looked like. And it was still really hard for me to understand, but I knew that, if I wanted to um, see more about what was going on in an asset, uh, acquisitions, finance, um, land was something that I didn't get a ton of exposure to. Um, but if I wanted to understand those, I needed to get smaller. And private equity was the right place for me to do that. So um, that's when I jumped into private equity and, and been there ever since. So um, it's really been a, an amazing realization to, to think all the way back at the beginning of my career, very near the beginning where I, was, I wanted to understand the business better. Uh, that was my goal. Um, there's been a lot of, a lot of bumps along the way, a, a lot of hurdles um, and challenges, but um, it's kind of cool to sit here and, and feel like, you know, look, I'm not done learning, man. None of us are done learning. Right. But um, I've got to be honest that I've, I kind of feel like I've accomplished a, a a major underlying goal for my career. And that's, and that's just going kind of getting more of a, uh, a view on the entire process, not staying at a, at a, a major, actually one of the biggest majors, um, whether it's Exxon, whether it's whatever, whatever uh, major that is, you kind of got a, uh, a chance to wear several different hats going to a smaller uh, private equity backed company. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And uh, it's not to say that, you know, if I was plucked, and dropped into Exxon Mobil that I would completely understand how to run that company. Uh, it's just not, not the case, but uh, it's been um, amazing to, to, you know, over the last four years in particular, JP, like uh, finance was something that, you know, first part of my private equity career, you know, with the oil and gas, I didn't get a tremendous amount of exposure there. I was more responsible and focused on like starting an operation from nothing, like drilling, getting our first well drilled. Um, but over the last four years with Petro Legacy, learning now to, um, you know, properly risk an investment, um, evaluate an investment, risk it, um, create a path to value, um, you know, what's that going to look like? Is it going to be drilling a bunch of wells and converting those barrels in the ground to flowing barrels? Um, is that, is that how we're going to capture value or is it taking what's de-risked or, or risky acreage and de-risking that? Uh, drilling enough wells to, you know, reduce the, the amount of uncertainty in what uh, a buyer would be looking at. So, um, as well as just sourcing capital. So, how was how that learning curve from you from going from a primarily operations background to kind of being thrust into the, uh, the leadership role, uh, the chief, the CEO role, and to having to understand and have these conversations when it comes to finance, uh, financing the well from, you know, inception to, to, to production online? I mean, how was that for you? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like every, every other learning curve. I like to say, um, you know, it was kind of like drinking from a fire hose, but tasted pretty good. Like, you know, you know that you're overwhelmed, but I find that I find for myself when I'm overwhelmed, I know that I'm learning things. Like I'm getting outside of my comfort zone. I'm being pushed, but I will, I'll take a moment and just tell you like having the partners that I do, and, uh, and I, to be clear, there I have uh, three partners 
there's four partners, including myself. Um, but having the partners that I do um, to to lean on with the land background, finance, and um, subsurface engineering, uh, reservoir, and, and geology, um, the, it enables us to grow faster and go further uh, as we lean on each other. So I, I would condone um, anybody that's you know looking at a situation of, of potentially partnering up with others like you really, you really um, if, if you trust each other, um, you can really learn a lot more quickly um, if you allow others to lead you, right? Like, I knew that I had strengths to bring to that relationship, that partnership, um, but leaning on Chris at times or leaning on JD um, or Aaron, my other partners, uh, I think has enabled us to make better decisions and, and go further as a team. And I would throw NCAP in there as well, like, you know, our financial partner, like, those guys, um, they taught me a lot. And um, it's been, like I said, a lot of fun getting stretched, um, not always pain-free, but um, I just believe when you don't, if you don't get outside of your comfort zone, like, great things aren't going to happen. You're not going to grow. You're not going to grow if you're not challenged with something new um, yeah. in your career. So let's let's kind of dive into the, kind of the uh, the meat of what we want to discuss. This kind of uh, goes against the normal format that we, we're doing on Round the Road, but I'm excited about it. So let's talk about uh, the current state of affairs and kind of uh, what that looks like for the for the U.S. oil and gas industry. So right now we, we're we're facing COVID. There's no demand right now, or there's very little demand uh, for for oil and gas. The supply is through the roof right now. People are maxing out on their capability to store. Uh, oil. So, how do we, as an industry, uh, compete with uh, with other these other oil supplies around the world, the Russia, OPEC? I mean, co- countries like that. Yeah, I think that's such a hot topic, and um, you know, it's one that we definitely should take some time to just opine on here. But uh, my short answer is, um, and I don't know if if this is just the the way that I'm wired internally or if it's something that uh, you know, maybe I've learned over um, my career here is having to adapt so much. Um, but the way that I look at this, JP, is you've got energy is a, you know, a worldwide uh, commodity, if you will. And that energy can be supplied, like mankind uses energy, like we know that, um, and we use a lot of it. Um, there are all, multiple sources, um, but the lion's share of it is fossil fuels. Um, you know, renewables are growing uh, part of that equation and an important part of the equation, but fossil fuels, um, you know, that's it. Like, it's the most um, effective source of energy. And look, the world's not using as much energy um, as we had would have expected without COVID, but what was pre-existing that, um, epidemic or pandemic. I don't know which, which it is now. Maybe it's both. Um, I think it's a pandemic, but then again, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know. pandemic when it goes global. Yes, yes, I believe so. I believe that's correct. Yeah, I'm going to watch Outbreak again tonight and make sure I got that right. But, it's based, uh, based on a true story. <laughs> it is now. Um, but look, um, you know, what I, what I feel compelled to, to say to myself and, and others is is that before that ever started, we had a real issue with oversupply in our industry. We had the ability now to deliver barrels. Um, and we already saw this happen with natural gas years ago, and it, it hasn't yet changed. But now, now oil is suffering somewhat the same problem where you can get gobs and gobs of this um, to the market a lot more easily than we could over the last 20 years, 30 years of our lives. Um, the last 10 years or so, um, we've learned how to produce this to the market much more easily than, than we had in the past. Now, are we doing it profitably is the real question. I think that's what we're finding ourselves uh, now when you throw COVID on top of uh, rampant um, growth and supply is like what is really the most uh, profitable barrel to supply to the market 
because some of what we in the U.S. and, and I think in perhaps some other places globally, we're bringing barrels to the market that, that do not compete at a price point that all the other barrels do. And, and quite frankly, very little of the world's production competes at uh, $12, $15 pricing. Um, yeah, so I think there's lots to talk about there, but, but how we compete, to, get, to answer your question, I think how we compete is we have to learn how to manage that supply. OPEC's done that for us in the past when they were the global control on that balance. And we could talk about, you know, how corrupt that may be or what, what people think politically, but they just got good at controlling that. And so how, how is, how, well, let me ask you a question. How has there been such a disconnect? And I'm, I'm not trying to paraphrase and put words in, words in your mouth, but how has there, there, there been such a disconnect between what seems like the, the fundamentals of economics, supply and demand, uh, price points, and kind of what we're bringing on, what the U.S. You know, oil and gas market is bringing online? You said, mm-hmm. you know, bringing online, you know, price that we can't compete. Like what, how are we not, how are we not getting it? That's uh, totally, yeah, that's such a great question because, how did we get here, right? Um, I'm going to just say there's there's been a perversion in in our market, um, and, and who's at fault here is not really, I think, even important. I think we've all played a role in um, taking um, readily available capital uh, from sources like Wall Street and, and public investors, and growing these public EMP companies. At uh, at a rate that was, you know, quite frankly, um, not sustainable. Um, ahead of our data, really understanding what the productivity of the wells is going to look like, and parent-child relationships, and um, you know, ultimate you know stimulation uh, potentials and um, decline analysis. Um, we threw a lot of capital at growing, going and grabbing assets, grabbing acres, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars an acre in some cases, um, and some of that's really good, really good acreage, but some of it's not. And so, capital was provided to go buy these things and then try to make a return on them, try to make a profit on them, and that's where really where I think um, the system began to break down. I think you know, late 2018, early 2019, where Wall Street started to kind of say, hey, we've thrown a lot of capital at this machine and we're not getting anything back. We're not getting any, you know, stock appreciation is one thing, but like I'm not seeing any cash back in my pocket. I'm not seeing dividends right. back. And on paper, the company is growing, but every dollar that it makes is going back into the company and then you're taking more of my dollars and putting it back in the company. Like it's not, it's not a cash machine. So it's one of those so, things. It's, it's, it's sorry, not to, not interrupt, but we'll get back to, so it's one of those things where I guess everyone, everyone wanted to be at the table. We were everyone wanted to be on the bus. We weren't sure where that bus was going, but if you weren't on that bus, you were going to lose in the long run. Right. So it was kind of, um, I don't want to say blindly in the blind, but, it was kind of a position like you wanted a seat on that bus and no matter what you're paying for the acreage, no matter what you're paying for this, you, oh, yeah. you wanted to be on that bus. You needed to be on that bus to survive, to remain relevant. You needed to grow. Okay. So that's why I say like, it's not a wall street. There, there's nowhere to place blame, but um, you're absolutely right. You needed to be on that bus. You needed to have size and scale um, to remain relevant so you could continue to get capital from these um, capital providers. Um, you know, and that all changed in 2018. 2019 was essentially Wall Street telling our industry, go make money. Go show me that you can make money, that you can take a barrel out of the ground, sell it for a profit, take that profit, reinvest some of it into drilling more wells, and then give some of it back to the investors. You know, show that you can maintain this machine, grow it a little bit if you want to, but show that this machine can print money and, and return to the investors. And so started to see that happen. Like companies like uh, Parsley was a great leader in, you know, stepping back from, you know, down spacing and widening out the well spacing a little bit to allow the wells to perform a little bit better, get better cash on cash returns out of those wells. Um, 
all and many other companies, public companies, followed or were right in, in parallel with them. But that started to create an environment where um, you could see a better return of cash and create dividends or increase dividends back to the investors. So we started to see that in 2019. Growth was still there, but companies weren't growing production at 20%, 25% single digit growth production. Sometimes, you know, uh, maybe just keeping it flat. Capital budget was going to keep production flat, and we're going to send cash back to the investors. So we were getting there in 2019. Right. Well, then what happens, right? Like um, we see OPEC um, kind of holding back and holding back, um, keep being asked to take barrels off the table, uh, and um, America's production slowly growing, and we're getting more effective. But all of a sudden. OPEC and Russia decide to have a little bit of a tit for tat and um, basically just flood the market with oil. I forget what day this was. I should have looked it up, but I remember where I was. I was actually on a hunting trip. And listen, man, I woke up and I told those guys, uh, I was really excited to be there, but I was like, I can't do this. Um, you know, the world is changing right now in front of our eyes and, and, and you know, basically hustled back to the office to kind of circle the wagons with everybody. Uh, but that, that was somewhat related and maybe preceding COVID slightly. But um, I think, it, you know, I think there was like two or three days before cities started shutting down and then the OPEC Russia disagreement came, came, came uh, to light. So yeah, it was, I mean, it was very overlapping. I'm not sure what came first. Yeah. So, so my opinion, like our industry was already in a very precarious position and then COVID really placed the spotlight on it. And so, listen, I think that as much as that, as much as that sucks and I would love to change it, I, I think what it does do is it, it's almost uh, taking a scorched earth, right? Um, we now have no option but to adapt to this and get good at what we do, get better at what we do um, so that we can solve this crisis, not survive it, solve it. And in my opinion, that means um, innovating, you know, the ways that we do things. Well, what do you mean? I mean, that's such a, it's such a, a broad statement. I mean, I was going to talk to, I was going to talk to you yeah. about, it. I mean, how, how do we change our business practices? Cause you're right. In 2019, I feel that companies, they were uh, uh, stopping their drilling activity to remain cash flow positive, which is kind of something that you really didn't, you talked about, but you really didn't stick to um, in the oil and gas industry. But I remember um, companies were slowing down in August, you know, before, you know, the previous years, they were slowing down mid-October, mid-November, and you had probably a month yeah. and a half of no drilling activity, and then budgets would hit, Q1 would hit, and back at it. So, I felt I feel like we did start getting a little bit better at operating within positive cash flow, and then you're right, we got hit. So how do we make ourselves as an industry be more attractive to Wall Street um, to not have a a, 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 a a black eye when we're when we're uh, on on the Wall Street platform? So how do how do we make our industry more attractive? Yeah, I think it, and. This is really um, about collaboration. It's one of the things I, it's probably one of the things I love most about our industry. And uh, the, the, the adaptability of our people and the collaboration between, you know, the, the EMP companies, the service providers, midstream, um, and even down to the mineral owners, like everything's off, everything's on the table now for discussion. And, um, you know, let's talk about like what innovation looks like and, and be less generic here. Um, one of the areas that I think we'll, we'll see um, a, a bit of a spotlight on is, you know, some of what was, some of what led to the oversupply and in, in continued drilling of, of barrels that weren't necessarily competitive um, is our lease agreement. You know, when, when we set up a lease agreement between us and a mineral owner, it's a relationship, it's a partnership that begins. There's terms associated with it. And in a competitive environment like what we have been in, uh, you might have a three-year time window 
to drill a well, you might actually have to drill multiple wells once you do that, but you have a three-year primary term to say, like, after that, like, sorry, you lost the opportunity. It was, it was enjoyable, but now mineral owner is going to go sign a contract with a new company. Or you have to re-sign with them. And so that what that led to is running, you know, we've got to get a rig there. And that kind of changes, you know, the emotions of the, the economic decision that you're making. You know, because you're running a different math problem of like, well, is this the profitable, most profitable thing we could be doing with our dollar today? Maybe not. But if we don't drill that well or start that clock of drilling wells um, or keep up with that clock of drilling, drilling wells, like, I'm going to lose, we're going to lose the opportunity to develop that resource. The, the, mo- so, the, motiv- the motivation changes. It becomes from running a, a, a good, smart, profitable business to we have to do this. This is something we have to do. We agreed on this two years yeah. ago, so we got to spend money on it right now. Yeah, and, and look, um, those decisions are like, they're always very tough. I've been on, um, involved in those conversations. But what I think will be innovated between us and, and mineral owners going forward is that we need to sit down and we need to talk about having um, flexibility. Like the goal is to, it, it's for both parties to win. The goal is not to fleece the mineral owner, and the goal should not be to um, provide mineral revenue or royalties to somebody at the expense of the company. Like those, those don't work for our industry. Like, so I think what's going to happen, and we're already seeing this, JP. Like, in this environment, there are uh, lots of old vertical wells that are that are not profitable to even produce today. It's say twelve dollars a barrel. Like our lifting costs to get it out of the ground might be fifteen. So it's like you don't keep producing those, right? But sometimes you have to, or you lose the lease. Like there's all kinds of complexities here. But basically, we need to sit down as an industry with a lot of mineral owners and say, "Hey, look, let's protect your your barrels um, and make sure that we can get them to the market profitably and get you your revenue." So we're gonna need flexibility. Maybe can we arrange a shut-in royalty um, where that's not on the lease today? Let's let's make an amendment, and that amendment can have a fuse on it and disappear in two years. But today, it'd be best for you and I if we left that well shut in for a year, or until prices recover, for a very you know reasonable fee. Like let's set something up to provide that flexibility so that um, we don't lose the asset or lose the opportunity in the meantime, just because we're trying to uphold the lease. So, so cl- there's going to be some innovation there. So, so you're talking about the innovation uh, going back to the, the, the mineral owners right now and how do you uh, negotiate those leases and all that stuff. However, I, what I'm hearing from you is that there there's, needs to be a mindset change, not just from the mineral owners, but throughout the entire process. Correct. And so we yeah. really need to change so as an industry. Profit first. Profit over profit growth. Profit first. Yeah, absolutely. Profit first. And, and uh, not everybody will be there, like, mentally. Um, so there's going to be some, some difficulties uh, between mineral owners and companies and service providers, midstream companies, um, financial providers, um, banks. Um, like, all these are different conversations to have so that the industry can, in a healthy way, innovate and create profitable supply to the market. And look, it might not be, you know, at the production levels that we have seen as of recent. Um, We might actually produce a fraction of that in the future, but it's going to be a meaningfully greater profit. And that's what matters. Uh, So how do you see some people, uh, I guess, leaders of some companies that probably won't, that may be more difficult to adapt that mindset? Um, it seems like it takes kind of the entire industry to, to jump on board with this, with this new paradigm shift or this mindset shift. I mean, how do you see these uh, executives or these leadership teams that kind of want to do it how we did it last year or the year before? I mean, do you see them kind of being pushed out? I mean, I don't want to put words in my mouth, but what do you, how do you see those type of uh, leaders kind of in the new oil field moving forward? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a tough question to answer, like, or quanti- quantify today. Um, 
But I truly think because of the the pandemic that we're in that has taken what is a kind of a an imbalance or supply demand equation, like we've seen that before. You know, we've been through that before. Like we've been through downturns and like service providers will slash their costs, you know, and EMP companies will lay off people, you know, and it it you go kind of scorched earth for a bit and then you you come out of that. And the industry's been through that before. And that's what I think has prepared us for for this challenge is, you know, knowing what those stories were and knowing how people got through those those environments. But I think the the complete destruction of the of demand for this worldwide um, energy that we can supply. Um, I don't think companies have the liquidity that they will need to just do it the way we've done it before. I don't think that, um, and look, I'll be wrong, there's no absolute, but I think it's gonna be a whole lot harder to just say like, hey, we've done this before, you know, we're gonna splash spending and uh, we're gonna lay off half the staff and we're just going to wait for prices to get better. Um, I think once prices get better, what we're gonna find is that prices aren't what we would like them to be. And those companies will, if they had to work on lowering their cost of, of supply, um, they might not be able to compete in that new world. And talk so, to me, talk to me, talk to me real quick about, I mean, you have, uh, you saying that and kind of, you know, reduction and cutting costs and all that stuff. A lot of a big reaction is people to slash GNA. What are your thoughts on, I mean, just kind of that being the answer to, uh, to appease those above you slashing GNA. Well, look, I, I think that that's part of the equation. Um, that doesn't solve the math problem. Um, you know, because GNA, like if you think about the, the capital budgets are huge dollar amounts. Um, operating expenses are big amounts, but GNA is an even smaller amount of that. So you could, I, I mean, we had this debate recently and, and um, you know, we've had to flash like an attack our GNA, but like we could get GNA to zero. Um, that doesn't necessarily protect the company um, and, and solve the crisis. Like we have to really attack the dollars that we're spending on the capital side and the dollars we're spending on the expense side and, and take control of those in a way that um, we have full understanding of how much it costs us to um, stimulate a well and, and what the, the, the cost basis is for those products and services like stand, profit. Like, I'm just gonna be honest with you, like historically that's been something that is, you know, the pressure pumping companies have shown up on location with. And, you know, we have to do some testing and be selective about which profits they're bringing, but it's priced into um, the, um, you know, the stage costs. Uh, that we pay that pressure pumping company and like that's going to get broken down and taken apart and that's already started to happen really but you know the, the chemicals and, and the, the profit uh, will get separated from the from the equipment and the people and uh, I think because of that um, we will we will be able to take control of what we're spending in each of those areas whereas before you know one plus one plus one equals three, like we might be able to get, you know, one plus one plus one equals two or two and a half, um, just by nature of focusing on each of them individually. But it's gotta be collaborative. Look, we've got to work with pressure pumping companies and, and, and profit providers to really understand like, how do we eradicate the, the fluctuations in their business so that we can get uh, straightforward pricing into our business and that we can sort of uh, take the volatility, minimize the volatility in, in our day to day work and we can start to provide a streamlined barrel at a pretty, it's pretty well defined profit margin. Now, and on the EMP side, what that's going to require us to do is like typically, you know, you go drill a well 
spend, let's say, just eight million bucks, you know, put a well on the ground, you know, and then you get to see what what price you get to sell your product for and how much product you're going to get. And there's um, risk in both of those those equations or variables, but you can you can reduce the risk in both of those uh, primarily in price, but then also the volatility of uh, well results um, by how quickly we move. So you can reduce the volatility on our side, you can reduce the volatility on the service provider side, but it's going to take, I think, a lot of focused collaboration. So, and, I, um, so I have a question about that collaboration. Right now you're kind of talking about a completely par a shift on how we do business from, as we said before, from the lease owners all the way up to the MP companies and bring in the service side, bring in the rig contracts and all that. What, <clears throat> when you communicate this to other, um, I guess, uh, industry leaders and stuff like that, what kind of feedback are you getting? Are you, uh, when you kind of, is this kind of a general consensus or is it kind of being kicked back a little bit? Are people agreeing with, with this, uh, with this, uh, with this viewpoint? Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's not really a lot of kickback. Um, I think a lot of people will, will, will like almost sometimes they passively agree. Um, they're like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think the the differentiating point that I see is there are people that recognize it and kind of talk about it, um, and they may actually get to work on it. But then I see people that are actually going to work on these problems. Um, going back to the mineral owners, like that's one where, like I've talked to a number of operators on more on the private side than on the public about this, but I know there are mineral owners that have sat down with companies and they have renegotiated um, the the terms of a, a primary term or um, you know during the production phase of the well, like giving. The, the company the ability to shut off unprofitable barrels, save them for later, and stop uh, bleeding money in the meantime. So there's people that are going to work on that now. Um, not not so much on the server side, I guess, because everybody's just like like tightening the screws on on capital spending right now, shutting it off basically. Um, but that will come. So there's there's not pushback from people. I think. There's maybe um, people that I see that aren't taking action. And I get it, like, it feels like this has been going on for a year, but it's really only been, what, six weeks? Yeah, about six weeks uh, now. Yeah, so, I mean, we're still early. We're way early, I think, um, and have time to uh, to tackle these, these challenges, at least um, – I feel like there's time, but I, I'm kind of like, I don't know. I, my parents just raised me to where like, I don't let grass grow on my feet. I don't assume that I have time. Um, Cause I think those are assumptions that can, can absolutely crush you. So, you know, we've gotten to work on them. Um, we've gotten to work on a number of different parts of our operating expenses and tackling those and then uh, approaching our mental owners and having the right conversation so that we can um, begin to throttle the uh, those variables in a favorable direction for the company and then ultimately for the mental, mental owner. And uh, so we're, we're getting to work on them. I think there's some people that, that are sort of just a little head in the sand, but, uh, you know, look, they'll, they'll pop their heads out and, you know, they'll see some good things happening and they'll, they'll jump on and get after it themselves. But no, one, you know, no one's really come out and like disputing the fact that our industry needs to get more, more competitive. Like we're in a price war. We're in a global price war. And uh, everybody does kind of understand like you've got to make some changes. Look at Parsley and um, Pioneer, you know, trying to approach the Railroad Commission and um, – create some alignment amongst uh, the domestic, at least in, in, in Texas, um, uh, the producers in Texas, like if, if everybody were to lock arms and decide we're going to pull back 20% um, 
I, I think there, there could be some validity to that objective. So that's just, that's completely unheard of. Like we haven't seen anything like that in our industry in decades. Right. Longer than that. I mean, the thing is though, I think you're exactly right. I mean, right now is definitely a certain period of panic pause. I mean, everyone's panicking right now <clears throat> and everyone's pausing on kind of what they're doing. They're kind of waiting. Um, I think it's partly waiting, partly they can't do anything. And a lot of it's probably hope. We're all hoping things kind of return back to where they were. We're all hoping the demand goes up. We're all hoping that, right. you know, it's kind of a, a, a blip on the radar, you know, in our career. It's like, oh, I remember that. But I think that's what you're, what you're stressing right now is completely, completely valid is that we have an opportunity and we have to, first off. It's a necessity and an opportunity. The necessity is that we have to change with how we do our business, you know, whether it's the service side or EMP companies. And then on the other side of that is that it's an opportunity to change. Um, where else can we find, you know, uh, uh, synergies or where else can, what else can we offer? What value can be offered? Um, how do we, how do we realign the direction of the bus and all of us be on board? Yeah. On that? So I think, I think it's definitely a, I think people with their head in the sands and, and their playbook is hope or uh, let's just, you know, push through this. I don't think that is realistic in this industry. I do think that people definitely need to change, like either write their own playbook or, or kind of just, you know, start thinking outside the box. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I'd, I'd be curious, like your, your viewpoints on this. I mean, we talked a little bit about it before, but this isn't just about, um, EMP companies leading the charge, like, you know, from y'all's side of the business, you know, I think that there's, um, you know, certainly some validity to um, getting out there and pushing the envelope about how you guys interact with, um, you know, the folks that, that work, work for you or work with you. And then also the folks that you, you know, contract for, um, like there's got to be, some opportunity to make those relationships and interactions like more effective um, and streamlined in the future. Like spend less time getting done what we get done so that we can do more is the way that I think about it. Um, so I'll give you an example on our um, the production side of the business. And this sounds asinine when I say it out loud, but it's very true, like water hauling, water disposal um, is a primary cost item for these um, old, um, you know, kind of comb stripper, but vertical wells that are producing, let's say, anywhere from five barrels a day or less. Um, in order for those to be profitable, like you basically got chemicals, water, and power. Um, so water being, being a controllable part of that, like when I started looking at it, we're, we're spending, um, you know, on a contractual basis, it might be a dollar a barrel or a dollar 10 a barrel, but we've actually wind up spending materially more than that, uh, for a couple of reasons. And, um, one of them that I, I figured out was that we're, the, the way that the, the invoicing occurs is super, super time consuming and many times prone to error. And I'm not saying it's, it's fraudulent. I'm just saying there's error. And, and um, when we decided to focus on, okay, what does the size of that problem look like? Like we mapped it out. It's 11 steps to get a barrel of oil off of our location and pay for it. 11 steps by Petro Legacy, different people in the organization, but uh, think everything from the lease operator calling it out to, you know, the engineer approving the invoice in uh, accounting paying it. Um, and so we've worked with a technology provider. And so we haven't even talked about technology, right? Like such a generic word gets thrown around a lot, but yeah, it's, 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 it's technology and innovation through technology and technology advancements, oh, yeah. but no one, really, no one really dives down and says, okay, well, how can it optimize our business right now? Yeah, 
like data is everywhere. I don't care about data. Yeah. Like, yeah. I got piles of data on servers and probably never been, some of it's never been even been looked at and never will be. So it's not about getting data. It's about um, putting the, the right information, the right data together and enabling the right people to either take action on it or create action out of that data. And so really what I find with the saltwater disposal uh, concept is like it's, it's a combination of uh, Petra Legacy's data, the trucking company's data, and the saltwater disposal company's data. And you put all those together under a, a platform with, with algorithms that, that can confirm things, measure things and confirm them. Like quite frankly, the, the, the water that goes on that truck to the disposal goes through a meter. And historically, like Petro Legacy's never had that information, except when you get an invoice and a, a copy of a paper ticket to say, okay, yeah, um, that was hauled and, and we'll pay it. Um, but that's, again, a person sitting down looking at it and looking at their notes and saying, yeah, that, that matches up. Like, that's just, man, that's just super time consuming and, and stupid. And the example that I use, like, when I get in an Uber and go downtown, um, I don't get out of that Uber and then look and say, yep, we drove 37 miles. Okay, that was 47 minutes. Um, yeah, that's within three minutes of what I had. Okay, you can, you can I will pay you. You don't do that. Like the tools on my phone and, and the driver's phone, like, and all the power in the cloud, like I have no idea what's going on back there, but it puts it all together and it's, it's way better at figuring out if what's truth, you know, compared to what I have in my brain, better and faster. So that's what we see beginning to happen with our, our barrels is that the right information is put in up front, the systems uh, communicate from there and ultimately we just get a clean invoice back that we're not doing this yet, but I believe that we'll be able to auto pay and, and get away from the hundreds and hundreds of, you know, vertical, um, you know, water hauling invoices that it just takes time for someone to click through and say like, yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. Or that looks wrong. Is that really 120 barrels or was that, is that 122 barrels? How did they even do 122 barrels? You can't get that on there. Like, all that time gone. So it's now really been that. So it's really looking at, I guess, every process and kind of looking at what makes sense. You know, let's 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 look at this. Uh, how we didn't look at this a year ago, year and a half ago. Does this make? If I was to design this, uh, this you know, water hauling or disposal, or whatever, does this make sense? This invoicing process and how do we simplify that and how do we make it more efficient and more accurate? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Like I, I would break it down into. <laughs> Just like Uber, you want, to be, you want to, to be able to procure something and pay for it. And all the other work that we do, when I say we, like I'm just thinking Jason as an engineer, like all the other work that I would do in that system is really just to make sure did, did we get what we paid for and was it at the price that it was supposed to be? And like, look, big companies like Exxon, they had a whole procurement department. They worried about all that. All, all Jason had to worry about was the engineering side of the business. But look, um, our industry is ripe with opportunity to get more efficient in what we do and, and spend less time doing what we historically have done so that we can um, focus more on uh, the value creation opportunities. Um, so yeah, it's just an example. Like, I feel like technology is out there that we don't even fully comprehend. Um, it's hard to go figure out how to apply those, but if we start with the problem and say, how do I, how do I tackle this problem? Um, I guarantee there's gonna be some innovation, to use that word. Um, it's gonna happen. I'm telling you it's gonna happen. Like one thing I would love to see someone solve is figure out how to, we've got, on our producing locations, JP, we've got tubing pressure, we got casing pressure, we got flow rates, we got electronic submersible pump data coming in, we've got tank levels, like we've got all kinds of data, plus our daily um, 
you know, the lease operators will go by daily and put in, you know, how much volume was produced and double, you know, double check the location. Got all that information coming in, like tying that together with the economics of the wealth that comes out of our accounting system. Our industry, so far I haven't, I haven't come across it, but we don't have tools to be able to, to empower the lease operators in the field, the people on the location every day to understand the economics of what they're doing. Is this well profitable? Yeah. How much money does this well make a month? Man, it only makes $2,500 a month. If I go put this uh, Kim Ray valve on there, that's going to eat up all our profit. Like maybe I'll tinker around with this Kim Ray valve you know, a little bit longer, you know, before I just call a Rasabak crew out and below the whole month of profit or three months of profit. And so it's like if someone could figure out how to begin providing um, those types of solutions to our industry, it will change the way we make decisions. So it's a little more transparency. Have... It's more transparency, oh, pushing absolutely. knowledge down, pushing data down. Yeah, to help, not, not to like, we're not trying to lord it over anybody, trying to point fingers, but um, enable the people with the right information to make better decisions happen. Well, and, and in fact, I mean, hell, why couldn't it, get, why couldn't it be like, you know, you go to um, Home Depot and you look for a refrigerator and it'll suggest dishwashers and stuff along with it. Like, why couldn't a lease operator stand there and say, like, hey, I'm looking at um, a problem with camera valve. Like, why couldn't there start to be suggestions about, hey, um, have you looked at this? Have you looked at that? You know, here's, here's how you can troubleshoot this valve instead of just calling a roustabout crew to come and replace it. Right, right. I know that's way out there, but... No, uh, no, that's, that's not out there. I mean, there's been a lot of talk of transparency. There's been a lot of talk of uh, pushing uh, information through every level of, uh, of an organization. So I don't think that's a bad thing. But let's, uh, I think we're coming close on time. I got kind of one more question kind of on the on the broad uh, uh, scheme of things. And mm -hmm. I kind of want to ask a couple personal questions, get to know you questions. Um, so discussing, I mean, everyone's talking about right now um, supply and everyone's talking about the Saudi oil and all that stuff. So what price can we actually compete at? And how do you, what's your stance on, I guess, people, uh, I guess, uh, promoting tariffs on, um, on foreign oil? And not, not getting political, but I mean, yeah, we, we discussed this earlier. We discussed this earlier and I kind of want you to share with the audience what we discussed. Yeah, well, because I think they are related. Um, tariffs are a way to control price, uh, manipulate price, if you will, uh, a political tool. And I think they're, that they are a, a not an important tool in our political system. So I want to say that up front, but I, but I do believe right now tariffs, um, while they would potentially prop up prices to, domestically and maybe bring WTI and Brent crude like closer in comparison. Um, they don't, in my opinion, address the root of our problem. The root of our problem being we've got a lot of barrels in the system that we haven't made productively and, and uh, competitively priced, um, but they're in our system. And so we either need to get those less profitable barrels out of the system so that the more profitable barrels um, can be brought to the market, or we just need to, you know, across the board, um, take our break-even prices lower. And I, I can't tell you, like, what I can tell you is that it's really challenging to develop new barrels, go drill wells to bring new barrels to um, supply it's really challenging in, in our uh, unconventional industry to do that below, you know, $35, $40 a barrel. There are places where you can, to be clear. There are places in the, in the Delaware and the Midland Basin. There are places in the, in the Eagle Herd that can compete at those levels. But what you see is these large basins shrink drastically um, at those price levels. Uh, for for anybody to meaningfully supply um, in the United States, like we need prices that, that are 40 plus. Um, so globally, um, I think that, uh, you know, we're challenged uh, because our break-even prices um, 
for a, a, a large number of the barrels is, is higher. But uh, with innovation, with uh, applying technologies, I think we can drive those numbers down, even if it's three, four, five dollars a barrel lower. That starts to open up more of the basin to to be able to be developable. I don't know, it's a hard word to say, but yeah. Um, let's I, let's I, I, go. No, finish that thought. No, I was just going to say I hope, I think that answers the question, but that's just you know how I see it. And again, hey, if anybody out there, and I'll repeat this at the end of the show, has any questions for Jason or myself, you can uh, email us at roundtherotary at cap-petro.com. Again, that's roundtherotary at cap-petro.com. Jason, I kind of want to talk a bit a little more on the personal side of things right now. Um, thank you for, you have such mm -hmm. good insight, and I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, in your career, I think this is a uh, kind of a tough question to ask. It's not like an interview question, but in your career, starting off, you know, at Exxon, XTO, Venado, um, and and to your current situation at Petro Legacy, can you give an example of something that I think that uh, that you screwed up on or messed up on that you've actually had to come to the table and admit that you were wrong? Yeah, that's a that's a fun question. Um, I think. One of the one of the things that I look back on and, and have had to admit that I I probably screwed up was uh, you know back in back in my days in the Barnett Shell so this was like 2006 through um, 2011 basically like went through um, you know the Great Recession kicked in um, had a huge impact on on uh, natural gas prices so like I remember running uh, work over economics at like $10 in NCS, um, and, and the drilling economics were insane. But, uh, you know, after that turned and, and gas was at a measly $4 in NCS, um, which is you know, far better than it is today. But I, I recall at that time, like, it became cost-cutting mode. And I was looking around at, like, you know, using the public data to say, you know, how, how little sand could I get away with um, putting away in these wells? you know, based, based on what my neighbors are producing and, and what they're stimulating with. And I mean, I remember pumping some wells of like 500 pounds per foot. Uh, so very little profit in those stimulations. And while I wasn't losing any productivity compared to my peers, I was never looking at the opposite side of that coin and, and testing. Um, the, basically I had no control. My control variable wasn't tested. Um, in that I never, I never experimented with, hey, what if I put 2,000 pounds per foot away? Would the well be wildly better and way more economic? Like, just quite frankly, my head never went there at that point in my career. And it uh, wasn't until I was at Bonato um, when, when we were faced with, um, you know, completion designs had evolved and quite frankly, uh, you know, we were thinking about slick water, but ultimately, like, it's never until, you know, Scott Garrick and I sat down and he was like, you know, Jason, we don't know. Because I was kind of still in the same mindset there, like, well, I want to, I want to cut back on profit. And he said, well, what if, what if we doubled it? You know, what data is out there to suggest what that could look like? And we get, we started looking and looking at I mean, took some time, but we eventually started to see it. And like, I think some of those wells are going down at like, where we started at 1,500 and got to 2,500 pounds per foot, I think they're pumping like three to 3,300 pounds per foot and making better economics. So it's just definitely, I think, a, an oversight um, driven by the environment that I was in and not being able to, to ask myself what I didn't know. All right. So that's interesting. So rather than save a little bit of cost uh, on the short term, short side of things, I mean, actually doubling it could potentially make the well more economic. Potentially. Yeah, basically, I, totally. And I think it came down to, I, I didn't realize we were still in design mode. I thought we were in manufacturing mode and knew um, the um, impact of all the variables. And we just didn't. We, we were still so early that we 
we were absolutely in design mode and needed to be experimenting with that design. So I guess wrapping this up, because we, I think uh, we have uh, about seven minutes left. Um, I guess going into this new chapter in the oil field, um, are you excited um, about everything? Are you a little bit scared? I mean, what, uh, where's your mindset fall right now with um, you understanding on, I guess, the total team collaboration and kind of moving forward on profit over growth mentality? Yeah, what I'm most excited about is, um, you know, getting to work with a lot of great people um, on, you know, all those different groups of people that I've talked about. Like, I'm, I'm excited about solving, you know, what the future can look like with NCAT, you know, our financial partner and with, with the bank that, that, that we've partnered with. Um, some of those are going to be kind of tough conversations, but I'm just excited about everybody's um, – we're all in different boats, but we're in the same storm. You know, some boats are you know larger and more protected. Some boats have holes in them. And, you know, we have to help each other out. Like we're all trying to weather the storm together. And uh, I'm excited about working with together with people and um, figuring out how to really change what we do. Um, so I'm excited about that. And, you know, I'm optimistic. I, I, I guess I'm optimistic because I have to be. <laughs> but honestly, I'm, I'm very hopeful that this will produce, um, you know, healthier, better run companies, E&P companies, public and private, service companies, um, and we have a better, you know, supply chain and logistical chain for bringing to the market what they need, and that's energy. Um, we have a, a tremendous I think um, responsibility to mankind to protect the uh, the supply of, of that energy because look, there's there's people around the world that need it. Uh, we need it here domestically, but there's you know people in third world countries like they deserve to to grow their economy and to better their their livelihood. So um, fossil fuels are a big part of that that energy supply chain, and um, I think it's going to be fun to. to go continue to work on, on that problem. That's a good point. We're giving the people the opportunity to grow their uh, GDP. So let's, uh, let's kind of wrap this up. What uh, I want, kind of want to get other things right now, but I guess we'll have you on again to kind of go into the personal side of things. What message would you have yeah, people? Right? What message would, uh, would you have uh, for uh, our listeners right now um, that you'd like to convey to them? Oh, you know, it's uh, look at the if you, I think if you're listening and, and it, it's been an incredibly tough month, it's been an incredibly tough six weeks. Um, and there's a lot to, to lose sleep over at night, but I, I think, uh, you know, one quote I love is, um, Steve Jobs, who said, uh, you know, innovation is the ability to see this change as opportunity and not a threat. And we don't need to feel threatened. Um, we don't, we can, we can have those emotions, but um, in addition to feeling threatened, like recognize that it, that, that produces, um, you know, the environment for us to rethink what we're doing, um, recognize that this is temporary and all things have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And um, we as human beings, you know, we have just the great ability to assess what's going on around us and, and, and make changes, take control of situations. Like, quite frankly, like, you know, we, we have a ball and, uh, you know, we have those abilities where other species don't. So, um, I don't know, I'm not trying to pump every, everybody up, but I do think it's important to remind yourself, um, each day that uh, you can take control of that day and focus on what you can control and not necessarily what you cannot. So. No, that's refreshing. I mean, a lot of people right now are thinking everything's out of my control. There's nothing I can do. Um, this sucks. Doom and gloom. Head in the sand. But I think that's uh, I think it's, it's very important to show that there is opportunity and there is um, opportunity in, in innovation. And not just technology and those buzzwords, but also on how we conduct business, how we do business. So, Jason, I want to thank you for, uh, for coming by today. And again, if anyone has any questions for Jason Churchill, the CEO of Petro Legacy, 
you can go ahead and email, email us at roundtherotary at cap-petro.com. Again, it's roundtherotary at cap-petro.com, cap-petro.com. Jason, thank you so much, man, and we'll love to have you on again. All right. Thanks for the time. It was great to see you. All right, buddy.